Death, the one constant. Every human is born with the knowledge that one day we are going to die, and we kind of just have to live with it. Some people are afraid of death, so they let this heavily influence their decisions, taking extra precautions as to preserve their ever-shrinking life. Others don't fear it, and they live their lives knowing that it could end any day, and being okay with that. But what happens when that same feeling is applied to everyone? When death is no longer a concern to anyone on the planet, would life be the same? This is where the disturbingly unsettling game Cruelty Squad comes into play. In this dystopian future, although covered up by its colorful bizarre graphics, death is no longer a constant. In fact, nobody ever truly dies here, and behind the scenes, life has lost its meaning and most people just kind of exist. Welcome, I'm Mr. Mirage, and today I'm going over how Cruelty Squad deals with immortality, corruption, and most importantly, the horrific CEO mindset. Now, before I go over the game itself, I feel like it's necessary to mention how odd some of the reviews are. Despite me previously watching gameplay of this game, and therefore kinda knew what was going on, the overwhelmingly positive reviews the game received intrigued me to figure out what this game was obviously trying to hide from me. Despite this, this game is extremely hard to understand, and it took me an obscene amount of research, including scanning every bit of dialogue in the game, attempting to beat the game for myself, and when I inevitably had a breakdown, watching just about every Cruelty Squad video essay YouTube had to offer. But still, there are a lot of things that I probably misinterpreted, so in order to avoid another Undertale situation from happening, I am encouraging you to take my analysis with a grain of salt. With that being said, When you first see gameplay of Cruelty Squad, you have one of two reactions. You either are incredibly intrigued or incredibly repulsed. I was a little both, but I could understand why someone wouldn't even want to try this game. The graphics are almost unnerving on purpose, like they are trying to drive the average person away. But if we are going to make it into the deeper meaning, we are going to need to look past all of that. The gameplay is similar to any other shooter game, although with questionable control choices. The weapons are surprisingly accurate, and will do an obscene amount of damage killing most enemies in one or two shots. But this goes both ways, as you too will be killed extremely easily. After dying, you may notice something isn't right. You don't actually die but instead your body is reconstructed for a small fee and you are sent right back into the mission. Our main character is a deranged, assumably ex-military, now depressed loner who spends his days suffering alone in his apartment, as many lower class people in this reality have come to do. An active shooter casually roams the streets below, gunning down crowds of bystanders seemingly unnoticed by anyone. You're probably confused on how something like this could take place but it's because, with death having no meaning, murder is far less of a crime, equivalent to maybe rear-ending someone in a parking lot or a simple speeding ticket, only requiring a small fee to fix. Everyone is depressed, and many people see no meaning to their lives anymore, simply just existing, as we see reinforced by many NPCs throughout the game. Despite this, it seems like life could be looking up for us, as we are hired by a disturbing blob creature known as the Handler, who we will see brief us on our missions. Since death has no permanent meaning, it is used instead to shift power more to fit the interests of the higher ups, who rather than having friendly competition, hire goons like the Cruelty Squad and specifically our protagonists to do their dirty work for them, giving us 13 disturbing levels to play through, each with their own targets and purpose whether it be to get revenge on someone mishandling funds, or to simply change who is in power. But despite what anyone might think, this still doesn't make a huge difference. 
the world has become simply a bunch of corporations trying to take power from each other, while everyone else suffers. And if you keep playing the game normally, it will emphasize this. It is obvious something needs to change. While not directly stated, it is implied that your main goal in this game is to find a purpose in life, to find happiness in a world which is mostly lost. But how are we going to accomplish this? We start with the most obvious. We have to ourselves become a CEO. Because that's certainly the issue here, right? Higher ups treating everyone like garbage? The system is corrupt and designed to keep everyone down, right? And that's certainly why we aren't happy. So we decide to go by the old saying, if you can't beat them, join them. From the beginning, you were encouraged to make this change. But how exactly do you adopt this CEO mindset? Well, apart from everything else in the game, money of course is one of the more important concepts. And when adopting the CEO mindset, you have to make as much money as possible and become a higher up, leaving your previous life behind. Then you'll be happy. Well, you hope so at least. There are three main ways to make money in this game. By completing missions of which a harder difficulty is available if you want more money, using the stock market, and by selling fish and organs for profit. The stock market is extremely random and difficult to predict, similar to how a real stock market would function except it moves on a second by second basis. I couldn't figure out how it worked exactly, so I moved on to fishing. You can start fishing by finding a fishing rod in one of the earlier levels from a man who seems to be isolating himself as he is upset with how people have tended to ridicule him for fishing before, only to immediately hop on the bandwagon once it became popular, alluding to yet more real life references which I will be going over more in depth later on in the video. Fishing is quite simple, similar to games like Minecraft in the fact where you can just simply sit there and just hope to get lucky. You can now use your newfound money buy anything and everything that you've ever wanted, including armor upgrades, cybernetics, and specifically a house in the countryside. The American dream. Now you can finally be free from all the chaos and... Oh, what the fuck is this? This whole time, despite believing that this would be better, you are met with living in a toxic wasteland, in an empty house surrounded by weird neighbors that diss you and then are surprised when the mentally ill assassin murders them in their own home. After killing your targets, you can return to the Cruelty Squad headquarters, where you can discover a secret room that you now have access to. Inside, you find somebody who might have an answer to this, why you're still not happy, and arguably worse off than you were before. But instead, you come face to face with a disturbing creature known by life itself, who utters a chilling message. What this basically explains to us is the undeniable fact that we have succeeded and we have risen up from where we've started and truly adopted the CEO mindset, but at what cost? Your friends are burning in hell, yet you smile. But hey, we have the house we always wanted, but is everything really different? Was this really the solution that we were looking for? No? Well, don't worry, there are more. Now this must be the solution. Don't enjoy the CEO life? Fuck it, let's destroy it all then. This is generally the easiest route to do, as it is mostly just following the main storyline. Although, in the beginning, you just serve the CEOs, eventually, you will start getting the wrong ideas and be targeted yourself. This path you are leading is a dangerous one. Between having to fight a cruelty squad member and swarms of police, this level is a brutal one. But, despite everything, we managed to escape this. 
and killed our landlord in the process. So, bonus, I guess? If it wasn't already obvious by now, the corporations of this game, including the ones you work for, are insanely corrupt and cruel. Human life is worth nothing, less than nothing to them, and loyalty is simply a formality given until you mess up or shift their profits. Which, for the record, all of that, the whole apartment raid, was written off as an accident made by a computing error. But to be honest, I think that is all bullshit. I just think that they quickly realized the protagonist was at a level above any of their other employees and was about to pull some John Wick shit and take down the whole company. Regardless of this, it seems like the handler has a change of heart and is back on our side. And not only that, seems now more interested in killing all of the higher ups that we work for, stating, wouldn't it be cool if you went to their meeting and just murdered them all? Well, I guess we are doing this now. The next couple missions are basically spent murdering all the people we have just been working for this entire time. And this just reinforces how little loyalty there is in this world and how quickly everything can change and power can shift. Once you finally come into contact with the higher ups, it is more disturbing than we could have possibly expected. Instead of some greedy cocky asshole dressed in suits, we come to into contact with basically lifeless husks of people, which can be referenced back to the encounter with life where we too became a CEO. They are all so focused on work that they barely are even human anymore, with odd dialogue that barely makes sense. It's become clear that despite believing otherwise, most of the people at the top are just as miserable, having no meaning in their lives and just existing to run the company and to inflict as much suffering as possible. Hiring companies like the Cruelty Squad to murder everyone condemning them to die over and over again. And despite killing them and ending all of this, we aren't done. The final level sees us enter a hellish landscape unlike any other level we've seen so far. It's almost as if the reality around you just collapsed. You have successfully destroyed everything, yet you still find yourself stuck without meaning, living a life without value. It's clear that both the options we've tried so far are not the solution. But there is one option left. Throughout this whole video, we've been trying to find a way to cope with the concept of immortality. Sure, there's no loss and no grief, but with that comes no meaning. Life just isn't worth anything and joining nor breaking the establishment will change that. So how are we going to fix this? If it wasn't clear, the only way to restore meaning to life is to restore what we lost, the concept of death, which surprisingly is possible in this game. Despite being extremely convoluted and difficult to obtain, we can surprisingly do this, although it is one of the hardest routes to take and requires the completion of every level in the game, including the house level. You will be left without cybernetics stranded in an abyss. Eventually, you will make it to the ending and meet Malice itself, who is one of three creators in this world known by Trigons. The other two we came into contact earlier being Life and Death. We are shown walking toward the giant death icon alongside many others, which to me implies that we are finally able to experience a true death. Before we succumb, we are given three voice lines as to allude to what this ending represents. The first screen represents an earlier time for the protagonist, a happier time. We all have that moment we wish we could go back to, whether it be a certain event or just being an ignorant kid in general, possibly indicating a time before he realized how terrible living with a mortality can be. The second line alludes to that the protagonist is a step above everyone else because he finally decided to do something about all of this, to actually make a change instead of just sitting in despair, waiting for something to happen like many others in the same predicament. Finally, the third and final text represents a new age, a golden age, where value is reintroduced to human life. We are able to die normally, and everyone in the world has a protagonist to thank for that. With this work done, our protagonist presumably dies in peace. Or, you know, as much peace as someone like him can. The world of Cruelty Squad has probably made a lot of you question your sanity at this point. That a game that literally looks like you decided to have the worst bad trip of your life could have such a dark, hidden meaning behind it. 
I honestly think the devs wanted to be extremely unique from any other FPS on the market, and I think they achieved that greatly. What scared me the most is the fact that after a while, you start to get used to the game. So when you have to wear armor made of flesh or use intestines as a grappling hook, it's no big deal. After the fourth or fifth ear piercing soundtrack, you kind of get used to and dare I say, kind of enjoy it. On top of what I've covered, Cruelty Squad does a great job of representing real world aspects into the game. Sometimes making you realize that some of the insane things that happen inside the game aren't too far off from what happens in real life. Like people consuming weird combination items for the fuck of it, only hopping on something when it's trending, and spending thousands of dollars on things that in reality are nothing more than paper and plastic. We even see references to VPNs, cryptocurrency, and of course the stock market. Cruelty Squad is obviously meant to portray a lesson to take into real life. What that is exactly has been interpreted in a lot of different ways, and to be honest, I'll leave it up to you to decide. As for me, I'm gonna go play some Corbino's Quest. Well, that was quite an adventure. I'm sad to see you go, but don't worry, this doesn't have to be the last time we see each other. I got another cool video, just for you. Hurry, the video's almost over.